welcome to Diverse Joy, a podcast where two so-called experts bring the joy back into conversations about diversity. My co-host is the incredible and bespeckled Dr. Will Cox. And my co-host is the thoughtful, insightful, oh. and fashionable <laughs> Dr. Amber Nelson. So, Amber, as always, we start by sharing our joy. So what's bringing you joy lately? Uh, well, it's that time of year when um, our, I, again, I live in the Pacific Northwest in uh, Portland, Oregon, or outside of Portland, Oregon, and we start having our outdoor uh, market, the Saturday market come up, and Portland's kind of, um, it's one of their f- famous outdoor markets and it's just so fun it's a really cool cultural experience it's always um music and dancing and all kinds of like local artisans coming in to share their crafts their arts their their products and it's all like locally made and sourced and it's such a cool opportunity to go and it's just takes up like a city block um right on the waterfront and it's so much fun um, to just go and experience this space with other local folks and people, uh, you know, coming in from out of town and enjoying the waterfront. And again, just the music, the vibe and um, getting to get all the art. I got um, some really great Star Wars art, actually. Um, recently, it was uh, Darth Vader and C-3PO and uh, just like a field of flowers. <laughs> and it's uh-huh. It is great. Uh, I love them. Uh, so, yeah, there's just so much to do and like fresh flowers that you can get for like really inexpensive. And uh, it's just such a great time and just spend hours just walking around and being with each other and experiencing the market. Oh, so yeah. I love I love that. Um, even when I go by myself, it's like one of the best times. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that's like one of the best things to do in the Portland area this this time of year. So how about you? What's bringing you joy? Uh, so this time of year uh, here in Wisconsin, we're coming out of our, our long winter. Well, we mm-hmm. have been for, for a few weeks now, uh, now that we're in May. One of my favorite things is my koi pond, uh, uh, yeah. something uh, you've, you've seen mm-hmm. before, but for the listeners and viewers, uh, I have a koi pond out back that I built myself. I, I d- dug it out by hand, <laughs> which is a lot of work. Um, Sounds like it. <laughs> and, and have had it for f- maybe four years now. Um, and uh, I, I love it. And so all the fish, they, they kind of uh, – hibernate's not the technical term because that's for mammals, uh, but they, they but go they hibernate. into a, yeah, a, a state of just ch- being very chill. Slow. Their metabolism slows mm-hmm. down with the cold, and they, they hi- quote-unquote hibernate under yeah. the ice for most of winter. But now's the time when now that their water's warmed up, they're yeah. very active. They're swishing oh. about, oh. and they're so so pretty and fun. That's um, so great. And so that's something that's bringing me joy right now, my oh. – Okay. Seeing my fishies and <laughs> love that. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> so great. They go into torpor. Torpor. Okay, I love that. That's the that's the hibernation term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was our producer. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. Well, I am super excited uh, to hear our main topic today. This is an area um, that you have done research on and have become. A, a little infamous <laughs> talking <laughs> <Yeah>. about. <laughs> Um, and I think it's something that like people talk about colloquially all the time. And so I'm super excited to hear about your research and kind of like, again, from a biased perspective, how we talk about gaydar. So gaydar. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just kind of gay stereotyping on the whole. So what what do you have for us, Will? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> infamous is a good word for it. So so I did this research a few years back now, like I think at least 10 years ago when I was getting started with it. Um, and, you know, my research has always been about bias and stereotyping um, a- across different target groups. Mm. So so I'll, I am a gay man. Uh, and so and gay stereotyping in part was an interest of mine because of that. But I've always done racial stereotyping, gender mm-hmm. stereotyping, mm-hmm. intersectional stereotyping. Mm-hmm. Uh, harking back to our last episode. Right. Uh, 
But uh, looking at how stereotypes operate and the functions they serve in society, most often negative functions, right. uh, like characterizing black folks as criminal, right. you know, served a historical function related to, to slavery and so on that then perpetuates itself today. Uh, but for uh, LGBT folks, mm -hmm. uh, one of the main functions that, that stereotypes serve is as categorization cues. Yeah. Uh, this can be linked to uh, a lot of things. One of the big contributors we look at is uh, the motion picture industry, especially in the earlier 1900s during what was called the Hayes Code, which uh, was a law regulation that uh, limited what could appear in the movies. And homosexuality was explicitly banned. You right. could not have same-sex couples or anything right, like that. Right. Um, but in these old movies, there were gay people in Hollywood um, and wanted some sort of uh, representation on screen. And so what they would do is they would have a man who acted a bit feminine, mm. um, who was maybe a, a bit fashionable, maybe worked as something like an interior designer or or uh, things that today we stereotypically, or hairdresser was a big one, Ooh, stereotypically yep. associate with gay men. Um, and he, he never kissed another man. He never held hands with another man. Right. Never said the word gay or homosexual or queer, but through mannerisms, dress, and so on, uh, the audience essentially kind of knew he was gay yeah. be because there were these... The, the coding that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, kind of coding. coding. He was mm -hmm. coded as gay mm -hmm. is one of the ways mm -hmm. we would talk about this yeah. academically. Yeah. yeah. Um, because there were these general ideas like, oh, gay men are more feminine than straight men. And yeah. so displaying these kind of more feminine traits or professions right. uh, uh, indicated that he was gay. And so right. so these stereotypic traits like dressing a certain way, mm. having one of those uh, kinds of professions we stereotypically mm -hmm. associate with gay men. Talking a certain he, way. Talking yeah. a certain mm -hmm. way. Uh, having a bit of swish when in your hips when you walk. Mm -hmm. uh, sissy that walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, all those are, are were served, served as categories categorization cues and people right. are like, oh, someone walks that way. If someone talks that way, that means they're gay. Therefore. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of became this idea of gaydar, which right. I'm sure most, a lot of people know this, people but it's heard it, yeah. gay plus radar right. equals gaydar. And yeah. so it means, you know, you, oh, you're detecting you're able to who's detect. gay. Yes. And now, um, so so that fit into my research in terms of how we're using stereotypes differently for different groups. Right. And I had some mm -hmm. very, uh, very basic science kinds of questions about how mm -hmm. that ends up being structured in your brain. Right. So, so some stereotypes are very bi-directional, which right. I know is one of your it's favorite one, words. It's my uh, word, yes. But, but so for instance, uh, the black criminal stereotype, people think that, that black men are criminals. Mm -hmm. They tend to think that criminals are black men. That's right. bi-directional. Right. And what I argued was because gay stereotypes uh, are often used as categorization cues, mm -hmm. very often they would be more unidirectional. Not, mm -hmm. not entirely, mm -hmm. but... Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so, so, so I was studying this. And basically, if you hear that a man likes shopping, this is right. one of the big stereotypic yeah. traits we had. If a man likes shopping, most people immediately assume he's gay. Right. And if you ask people to say what they think about gay men, they don't always say that he likes shopping at mm -hmm. as high of a rate. Right. And so that ended up being a more unidirectional-ish gotcha. stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And this is, I think it's very fascinating as a cognitive psychology exercise. Right. And right. I, I think it informs theoretical what's who's it's, but that's yes. not really what we talk about here. <laughs> yes. um, um, but, but there's, there's scientific reasons to be interested in that, to understand the structure of knowledge in the brain and, mm. and, and then how it gets used and also how we change it. But I was just doing, it was again, very basic research rather than applied research, right. which is what we usually talk about here. But as I was doing that work, I'm like, oh yeah, these stereotypes serve this function, some some people uh, in the literature, some reviewers I would get is like, what are you talking about? We don't use stereotypes like that. We can just tell who's gay. Like, uh, look at this look set at of gaydar things. research. Yeah. Um, and there was research where it was some of the stuff we're talking about, like, oh, gay men walk differently. Mm. There, there's something in their voices that's mm. different. And I was kind of like, well, that that, that doesn't quite make sense. Mm. So, so I also had a background in human sexuality education. Mm. And like, we know that what causes people to be gay or straight or by it, right. it's it there's no one thing right so so there's a set of genes that we've identified three genes on two chromosomes but they're only present in like the highest estimate is about 30 percent of gay mm. men um and, and it's 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 not to say that being gay is a choice or anything no, ridiculous like no, no, that no. it's just that the actual 
biological and psychological causes right. are multiple. There are right. different ways we all reach this thing that we have labeled as a society as as gay or right. whatever your sexual nature and nurture. Yeah, there Both. there Both are and. Uh, biological and developmental co- yep. contributors, prenatal contributors, all all kinds of things. All the things. But yep. but so this idea that. Um, oh, there's something physical that identifies all these gay men and makes them distinct from straight men on this fundamental kind of essentialist Mm -hmm. uh, thing. It it doesn't make sense from a sexuality science perspective either. And I was like, well, you know, it's clear this is how people use stereotypes, you know, (laughs) from my data, from just being out in the world. If you dress a certain way, you walk. um, And so I had to sort of deal with this kind of gaydar research where people Mm. were saying that that there's this accurate gaydar, right? Um, we can clearly tell who's who. Yeah, yeah. and and I think there's there can, can be motivated reasons for that. I think mm-hmm. as the gay community, we want to be able to uh, tell who one another is, right. and 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 it also kind of has a feeling of kind of bringing us together, but. Right. What I started arguing is that, well, if you're calling it gaydar, mm. uh, that, that kind of becomes what what uh, we in the literature call a legitimizing myth. Mm. Um, so legitimizing myths are things that make it okay to stereotype, make prejudice or oppression okay in, in some way, make it seem more innocent. Right. And so if you call it stereotyping, uh-huh. everyone kind of thinks stereotyping is bad. Is bad like we, we yeah. don't want to stereotype. Yeah. Right. But if you call it gaydar, right. then it's fun. Then it's, then it's kind know, of silly. It's, it's not that fun. serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something the gay community community has endorsed, which kind of implicitly makes it okay. Mm. And, and so, so so I had to dig into this area of research more that, than I had originally intended to. Yeah. Essentially, uh, so, so there are these studies that look at how gay and straight men walk, how they talk, uh, their facial structure. Mm. Um, facial and, structure. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay. T- they take pictures of gay and straight men's faces uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. and then have people guess who's gay and who's straight. Interesting. And they're able to show a- an accuracy that's above chance levels. Huh. But that's fascinating. <laughs> there's a big butt. <laughs> but there's a big butt. Big okay, butt. okay. <laughs> um, so I was gonna say a BBL butt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so for the listeners, BBL stands for uh, Brazilian butt lift, right? Uh, Brazilian surgical oh, procedure. At, yes. For, <laughs> um, that an episode of the TV show uh, Grand Crew. Grand Crew that we were showing every last night. Uh, Reference to yeah, yep. But yes, there's, there's a, a big, big there's a big BBL. There's butt. a big BBL butt. <laughs> so so it ends. Up being a mathematical problem and so I apologize to some of the audio listeners I'm going to try to explain it in as vivid and not technical Mm. a way as possible Um, and on the video we'll have a, a visual graphic that will help but but we're going to be talking about ratios, uh, and the the key thing to tune into uh, is the first number I say, the bigger it is relative to the second number, mm-hmm. the more different gay and straight men are. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so kind of fundamental to this idea of gay yeah. art is that gay men are fundamentally different from straight men in right. some detectable, detectable way that way. these senses pick up mm. on. But but the way these these studies work, uh, these these studies like looking at gay and straight men's faces or walks or talks, uh, the way the studies work, they they get uh, some gay men and some straight men, um, and 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 look at these kinds of features, um, and uh, they they bring into the lab a population of about fifty percent gay men and fifty percent straight men. Um, and to, to make it simple for our numbers, I'm just going to say 10 straight men and 10, mm-hmm. 10 gay men. And then they try to observe whatever the thing is that mm-hmm. they think is, is gaydar, um, in these gay and straight men. And they end up seeing that there is some kind of difference between them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it ends up being about the, the highest, the biggest difference they've been able to observe in any of these studies is about seven to three. Mm-hmm. Um, so so the, the way I talk about this and, and the way the graphic will show it online, mm-hmm. I, I, I call it the, the pink shirt uh, example. Mm-hmm. So let's imagine, like, so for, especially for the kids these days, uh, <laughs> back in the day, wearing a pink shirt was uh, something that people people really thought made a man gay <laughs> or like right. uh, any man Indicated, who was wearing yeah. a, a pink shirt. It was kind of like, Whoa, what are you doing there? You, yeah. Um, it, it was just kind of, uh, it broke gender norms yeah. and uh, therefore 
uh, there's kind of kind of the stereotype like right. oh if someone's wearing a pink shirt he's probably gay right um, so let's let's say that was Call the, the pink shirt yeah the kind of gaydar thing yeah. we were looking at uh, in, in the lab when they had these this fifty group of fifty percent gay men fifty percent straight men they'd have this kind of seven to three ratio so that mm-hmm. would mean about seventy percent of the gay men happen to be wearing, wearing pink, pink shirts shirt. mm-hmm. and not very many straight men maybe mm-hmm. like thirty percent okay uh, this same kind of ratio is like whatever these facial features are or you know uh, if they have a little more sway in their mm-hmm. walk it, it when people look at that. Talk. And then they categorize the guys as, as gay or straight based on those cues. Mm-hmm. They at most maybe get 70% accuracy. Okay. Okay. So we have this ratio of, of this feature seven of to seven three. to three. Okay. And I want to make it even more extreme. Okay. Uh, Do it. So let's say every single time any gay man walks out of the house, he's always wearing a pink shirt. 100% what, of the time. 100% of gay men, 100% of the time. Wear pink always all the wearing time. Pink shirts. I love it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and almost no straight men. Right. Okay. Like, so let's say one out of 10. Right. Uh, okay. So 10% of straight men. Right. So it's very rare for yeah. a straight man to wear a uh, pink shirt. That gives us a 10 to one ratio. Right. That's a huge difference between these right. two groups. And so if you have 10 gay men mm. and you have 10 straight men, mm-hmm. you have 10 gay men with pink shirts and one straight man with a pink yeah. shirt. So if every time you guess, yeah. hey, oh, pink shirt, he must be gay. Must be gay. You have a really you have high, a high chance of being accurate. Right. 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 Now, that's if 50% of the world were gay. Right. Not That's the case. not actually accurate, right? No. no. Okay. And okay. so, but mathematically, we can say, okay, for each person, how accurate are you? Mm. And then how does that translate to the real, real right. world? So the in the real world, the best estimates say <laughs> that maybe 5% of wow. the adult male population mm-hmm. identify as gay. That means 95% are right. straight. And just so, so the audio listeners can see... Um, uh, hear what's happening. He's showing me this diagram that's now got a hundred again men, men um, and ninety five of those are like coded as straight men, and five of them are coded as gay, which in, it's happening in, yeah. in color format, just so you can kind of see. There's like a hundred, hundred men, on the men mm-hmm. and ninety five. Ninety five of them are straight. Yeah. Now it, let's let's take that that idea that all gay men always wear pink shirts. Mm-hmm. So so all, so all our gay them, men were putting pink shirts on them yeah uh and only 10 percent of straight men wearing right. pink shirts in a real world right. where 95 percent of the men are straight right if you start guessing that every man with a pink shirt right. is gay right you're actually wrong two-thirds right. of the time uh, yeah. so that means about 10 straight men out of this hundred are wearing yeah. pink shirts and only all five of the gay men are wearing pink right. shirts but you have twice as many straight men who quote unquote seem gay based right. on the shirt stere- right. stereotype, stereotype that we're making up. Right. And this is true of the the face kind of gaydar that some researchers advocate for walking with more swish uh, uh, clothing stereotypes, yeah, things yeah. like that. Uh, our voice as voice, well. Yeah. So yep. having more of a gay quote unquote gay voice. Yeah. And so the issue with this is, you know, if we're using these kinds of stereotypic cues just by the sheer mathematical fact uh, that straight people outnumber gay people by yeah. such a huge margin. Yeah. Men, men specifically. This, the same kind of thing can be unpacked for lesbians as well, mm-hmm. uh, and lesbians and straight women. Um, you end up with this situation where there are actually more straight men mm. who quote unquote seem gay, gay. Yeah. based on the stereotypes than there are gay men in total. And wow. not all gay men wear pink shirts or right. or uh, act in a way stereotypically associated with, with gay men. Right. Uh, but even even if they did, even they at that exaggerated, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, if you're going throughout the world and making assumptions about people based on these kinds of superficial cues, right, uh, you're wrong much more often than right. you're right. It's still more likely, like if someone seems gay based right. on how they walk, how right. they talk, how they dress, right. it's still more likely that they're straight. Wow. Yeah. So, and again, we're looking, I'm looking at this photo, this diagram that's now showing five gay men in pink shirts and 10, 10 straight men in the pink shirts, right? So we're really seeing a one to two ratio, one person, one gay person to two straight people. Yeah. So if you're guessing, you're only right 
you're right less than half the what's the One, percentage? So so if you're <laughs> if you if you assume math is using not my strength. <laughs> <laughs> this this analogy, which I'm so sorry for the audio listeners right now. If you guess that a man with a pink shirt is gay, mm-hmm. uh, you're wrong two thirds of the time. Two thirds of the time. Yeah. Um, and that's 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 with this extreme example yeah. that doesn't look like anything we can actually observe in this gaydar research that's out there. Mm. Um and so so it's it's just not accurate. Now, why did this make me infamous as we started <laughs> off saying? Well, uh, some in the gay media got really upset. Um, they were like, you're taking away a part of our cultural yeah. identity. Mm. There was this one that, I mean, it amused me more than anything. But like uh, right after the headline, which was like telling us to shut up and we don't know what we're talking about. Mm. It was like in the articles like, Listen, straight researchers, get out of our community. You don't know what you're talking <laughs> you're about. Like, wait a minute. I was like, mm, well, Actually, I'm the lead author. I'm a gay man. I... <laughs> I'm very <laughs> in the gay community. Right. And one of my co-authors was a lesbian woman. And right. it's like, no, like we we're part, we're of, part of this community. And yes. and this is just, I mean, it's it's math and, and facts. It's, right. Uh, it, it's not trying to take joy away from, from right. kind of the gay community, but it's just recognizing uh, these sorts of things. Well, um, I- and it's what the math and science says right. about, which, well, can we accurately identify based on these kinds of stereotypical features? Which is important, again, when it comes to stereotyping and bias and how bias can, and, you know, in one of the next episodes or our last episodes, we're, we're going to talk about bias in healthcare, right? Yeah. And, like, finding these other ways in which um, if we rely on this gut instinct and the research really shows that we're, we're really bad self-evaluators, right? What, uh, being able to evaluate what we know and how accurately we know that, yeah. it just in general across the board, we're terrible. We're very, very bad at yeah. that. Um, and so relying on a gut instinct is always a, is always a bad. Always, always to always be questioned bad. at the it's very to be, least. It's always to be questioned at the very, very least. But I do wonder, you know, in hearing all of this, like just looking at the data, um, if they're in some of and hearing some of the pushback that that folks in the community gave, if there is a piece that feels like self-identifying, right, and maybe even self-protective, if I know I can tell who oh, is and isn't gay, then I know where I feel safe and where I don't feel safe. Yeah, and and, and uh, I think there absolutely is that motivation mm-hmm. behind wanting mm-hmm. to believe in this idea of gaydar. Uh, but the problem is if it's not accurate right like if you believe you have the sixth sense kind right. of a thing right right you know are you going someone home with someone who's about to sorry for the bringing in the negative but commit right. a hate crime for right. instance so right. matthew shepherd one of the most right. kind of famous uh awful tragedies in kind of gay u.s mm. culture went home with two guys he thought he was uh, going home to have a nice time mm. with, and they ended up uh, brutally murdering him. Wow. Um, and wow. I'm I'm sorry for bringing it down, but right. but but this is, this is part of the thing. And in fact, well, that's the harm. That's, that's the harm. That's the harm. And when we we trust this gut instinct and or basing it on these stereotypes, absolutely. And uh, actually, hate crimes was was a big area of my research mm. as well. And there are actually a, a ton of hate crime victims who actually are straight right. uh, because it's someone using these kinds of cues, yes. assuming that the person's gay. So a right. lot of straight victims of anti-gay hate crimes. Mm. And of course, we care about any victim of hate crime. It doesn't matter if it was mistaken. Regardless of what uh, it is. Yeah. I- identification. But the point is people use these kind of cues yes. Yes. for that 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 kind of uh, thing. Mm. Um, mm. And so like there, there was a, a young man named Damien Furch mm. who he had pink shoelaces. Wow. And uh, a couple of guys identified that and called him gay and, and beat him up. Wow. For instance, that's uh, and so using these kinds of cues also uh, has has been a tool of hate. Mm. Um, and and it's not you know so stereotypes in general they restrict our opportunities they they lead to to marginalization in a lot of different ways. <laughs> So, so what you were just saying about, uh, you know, kind of often we're not good at assessing the validity of our gut reactions. Right. 
so t- two things that we've already covered in our skills in previous episodes, mm-hmm. confirmation bias right. uh, and untested assumptions yes. both contribute to this notion. People are like, well, I can think of all the times that I've been right mm-hmm. when I made an assumption that someone's gay based on something like this is why I know I'm good at gaydar. Right. Confirmation bias contributes to that big time because each time you were actually right, which again, even in our extreme example, which would never exist in the real right. world with that like two to one <laughs> kind of ratio or right. one to two ratio, uh, even in that extreme example, you're going to be right a third right. of the time. Right. And your brain with Remembers confirmation bias is going to yeah. remember it, weigh that example yeah. more heavily. And then untested assumptions. I was going to say, and also untested assumptions. Like there's all these times that you don't actually yeah. ask somebody, hey, are you gay? And actually uh, the backlash I got from that Gator research mm-hmm. led to my idea about untested assumptions, mm-hmm. which then I was able to connect to a huge cognitive literature that has already demonstrated this is how your brain works. Right. So you see someone walking down the street. He's kind of cute. He's mm-hmm. wearing fashionable clothing. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was just shopping. Right. And you're like, oh, he's gay. He's gay. <laughs> he's right. gay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. odds are you don't then run up to him and be like, hey, bro, you hey. gay? Right, right, like, right. <laughs> we just thought you were gay. Right. Like you just let him go about <laughs> his day. Go, go but in your day. brain, you treat you it have, as a fact. You have coded He's, him he as a gay, gay. guy. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, you end up with all the stuff that our brain does because our brain wants to perpetuate the stereotypes. Right. It wants to rely on the things that make it easier. Right. Um, Those schemas. And mm-hmm. and uh, so, so so in some of this research, like we had one study where we told people Gator was a real thing. Mm. It led them to stereotype uh, more. significantly more mm. than our control group. Mm. When we tell people, hey, Gator's just stereotyping. Right. Like uh, not even telling them that stereotyping is bad. We let them have a value judgment if they have one. Right. We just say, actually, it's just another term for stereotyping. Yeah. They stop stereotyping. Ooh. In this kind of gay stereotyping. Right. And so just that message out there, like, look, this idea of the gaydar myth, right. gaydar is a legitimizing myth, right. it perpetuates these stereotypes. Mm. And I also want to be clear uh, about another thing you said about, uh, you know, and, and, you know, these stereotypes, they can cause harm even, even when they happen to apply. So mm. again, we're not saying there's anything wrong with right. a, a gay man who is uh, sassy and right. silly or, right. or like fashionable. Or fashionable. Like, I mean, or- I, inspired by you, I try to be a little more fashionable <laughs> on this show. I don't think that's something I naturally. Nothing wrong with with any of that if you happen to match a stereotype mm. of what people think of gay men. Right. The problem is applying the stereotypes broadly and making assumptions about folks. Right. And, and I have one example of, of a way this these kind of stereotypes can cause harm, even among right. people who happen to match them. Right. Um, I, I think I briefly shared this story previously, but uh, I have a dear friend, uh, Mark Steele Hatlin, mm. uh, and he is hey. <laughs> Uh, he's a gay man. Uh, he is a hairdresser. He's a very successful hairdresser with his, his own business and uh, uh, is amazing with hair and makeup and all of that kind of stuff. And and is uh, stereotypically gay mm-hmm. in, in his mannerisms uh, and is just a hell of a lot of fun, <laughs> let me just say. So uh, my fantastic, fabulous friend, Mark, mm-hmm. um, he, he shared a story with me once when actually some of this media was coming out around all this kerfluffle around, yeah. uh, oh, this research is saying Gator is not real. Yeah. And, and he shared, you know, an experience where, you know, he's worked very hard to get where he's at. And, right. and there was this one time someone said something to him like, oh, well, you're gay. So obviously you're good at obviously. that. Obviously. Obviously. Right. And it's yeah. like, y- yes, he's, he's good at that, but he's good at it because he worked at it. He's right. a creative person. Uh, and he developed talents in these areas. Yeah. But then someone was like, well, because it's a stereotype, it's like, oh, it's just some natural thing because you're gay. Right. And uh, it completely dismissed all of his hard work and everything yes. that he does do to get where he is. And it's yeah. a similar thing when people say, like, well, an Asian person who's good at math. It's right. like, oh, well, of course you are. And it's right. like, no, like that is that person's particular talent that maybe they've right. worked hard on. And yeah, right. maybe the stereotype's also there. Right. But let's not discount someone's abilities mm-hmm. and, and what they're or even saying like, oh, you're you, again, um, or we only consider you good because you're gay. Like if you weren't gay, then we wouldn't think oh, that yeah, you no, were good. That, right. That you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I remember even for me, I mean, this isn't about being gay, but like as as a black woman. And when I went into college, I got a lot of like people were saying like, oh, you only got in because you're black. And Mm. like dismissing like, no, I worked hard. I had a four point something GPA over 4.0. You know, I like did 
all of the things. I got here on merit. Like you don't did just your melanin give you that GPA? Right, my, like, like how did that happen? Right, you know. And so like dismissing all the hard work and yeah. only like stereotyping because they're like, oh, well, you're just a diversity hire. So that's the only reason why you got here. Yeah. In the same way, like, oh, you're only good because you're gay, right? Or we only think that you're good because you're gay. Um, it's Again, it's dismissive. And and it, it, even when maybe a stereotype does apply, like he is gay and happens to be fantastic at yeah. all of these things that maybe are stereotypic, but it can be harmful and hurtful yeah. to then dismiss all of the work that he's put into yeah, it. Yeah, and you know, it, it could be like, the, let's say there's some other dimension of like, what makes people great hairdressers? I don't know. Right, so, right, some right, right, some right. kind of genetic <laughs> brain thing, just a weird hypothetical. Yes, yes. But you know what? Maybe it stops a lot mm. of straight men who have that talent yeah. from pursuing it. Right. And it's just, That's Mark is point. one of the, the people at random who yeah. has that talent and because he's gay he saw that he could he could fit that role like we talk mm. about representation mattering mm -hmm. right he was mm -hmm. like oh people like me can do this yeah and there's some super butch straight dudes yeah. or super butch gay dudes yeah. who they they don't see people like them represented yeah. in that field and so don't pursue it right or I, I was watching oh gosh I don't remember what movie this is I'll have to think about it. But there there was this wed a wedding planner who was coded as gay and was acting flamboyant and all these things. And later on, we find out, like, not, not that. Nice. <laughs> but, well, but I think he, if I'm going to remember correctly, I think he was gay, but not, he didn't act like that. That's not his normal patterns. But he's like, but nobody cares. Nobody wants to have a a wedding planner that is not that's butch that's butch yeah that's oh, that is so it was it was a f he had a fake persona he, he had, had a to put fake on, persona that he which, put on because then it made people feel more comfortable like obviously you're fabulous and obviously you're gonna have good taste because you present yeah. in this way and even though he was gay but was more butch oh yeah he like he's like nobody wants to like work with Tony, they want to work with Antonio, right? Oh, <laughs> like, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so these stereotypes, they they put pressure on us and, and restrict our opportunities, as I always like to say, yeah. you know, push us to think we have to act a certain way. Yeah. They become norms. We've yeah. talked about that. Norm enforcement. Yes. yes. Ah. All right. Yeah, so, that's great. so that's some of the Gator stuff. We have some like infographics and things, which yeah. I'll try to make sure we link uh, when we post this episode. Uh, and and yeah, so uh, I think we're going to take our little break yes. and go to story time. Story time. Welcome back from break. Um, and it, we're at story time. So, Will, I, you have a couple stories for us. Yeah, yeah. So uh, since we were talking about Gator, I yeah. kind of pulled out these uh, Gator-related stories. <laughs> um, and just, you know, we're talking about how these stereotypes can cause problems right. and, and why I, I personally am kind of on the uh, a side of being... Let's let let's let go of this idea of gaydar a bit, right? Um, so so I have a friend, um, who in high school started recognizing that he was attracted to men, mm. um, and you know from his background, what, the way he described it, he was like he was never anti-gay. He didn't come from like a very conservative Christian background that mm -hmm. was anti-gay or anything like that. So he didn't have a problem with the idea of being attracted to men, right? Right, but. His uh, examples in the media and basically from stereotypes were, well, gay means that you're flamboyant, that you're a theater kid, yes. that uh, you're like this. And, and he's yes. just not. He's a right. much more... Uh, butch mm -hmm, kind of dude mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and just like all the kind of fashionability and right. and these stereotypes of what gay meant right. wasn't him. Right. And so to to teenage uh, teenage him, he was like, well, I must not be gay because I'm not that. Yeah. There must just be something wrong with yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And he had a very bad like self-hating spiral for, yeah. for a long time wow. uh, where he became a severe alcoholic, drank and drank so much that he gained like 300 pounds wow. and, and was having mm -hmm. all these health problems mm. and hit, did the true alcoholic kind of rock bottom Wow! and had to, uh, you know, uh, cope with that, that addiction and, and mm -hmm. figure things out and eventually came to a point where it was like, you know what? Right. I'm just into guys. Like, right. Like, and, and, and it's an example of, you know, he couldn't see how he fit within the gay community or the idea of being gay because of the stereotypes. Yeah. The stereotypes didn't apply to him, so he thought it couldn't be gay. And right. it, it, it kind of had a, a negative impact on his life for, for a long time. 
Um, well, and that's like the idea of like whether you're conforming or not conforming to this stereotype can contribute to a sense of internalized homophobia, right? Like yeah. he's not, I don't. I don't fit the stereotype. Maybe I'm, there's something wrong with me. I'm not gay. Like then this like internalize um, that self hate around that. And and the problem is, you know, the stereotypes, as we often talk about, they become norms. Sometimes they become seemingly definitional of a group. Mm -hmm, And so mm -hmm. part of the definition of a stereotype is it's, a, an association beyond the definitional features. Right. So like if we're defining being black as having right. dark skin, right. you know, that's not a stereotype. Right. Right. Uh, but when we start tying it to things like poverty and mm-hmm. uh, criminality and other things, mm-hmm. th- those are the stereotypes. The right. definitional feature of being gay, a gay man <laughs> is you identify as a man <laughs> and you are attracted to other men. And anything Point beyond blank. that, yes. you know, <laughs> there could be cultural aspects to right. it, but when you apply it uh, uh, universally, it's a stereotype mm-hmm. right when you use it to make assumptions it's a stereotype right. and they can have myriad mm-hmm. negative effects but mm-hmm. but but this is one way where, where some a, a, a gay person mm-hmm. um or or someone who is coming to grips with their same-sex attraction right uh can't see themselves fitting in this stereotypical notion. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's the negative story, yeah. but we're going to, going to bring it up. So yes. one thing we try to do with positive stories, uh, is, uh, talk about what people doing things well, like overcoming mm-hmm. bias and maybe applying some of the tools, uh, that we teach in, mm-hmm. in all of our trainings and stuff, or, or just finding a better way of doing things. And so I have a story from uh, about some friends, uh, including former guests, mm-hmm. and former and, and future guests, probably, uh, Sandy Eichel and their wife, mm-hmm. uh, uh, both good friends. Uh, uh, Sandy's wife's name is, is Nancy. And after there was all this kind of media hubbub about like, oh, this Gator research and Gator is actually not accurate and it's really stereotyping most of the time. Whenever they would be kind of watching a TV show or seeing someone on the news, they would, you know, as many people do, and I think right. especially in the LGBT community, sometimes we maybe do more. We're like, oh, he's gay. Right. Like based on these kinds of stereotypical right. things, like, oh, look at how he's dressed, like talking yeah. about some politician or yeah. the lilt in that person's voice. Right. He's gay. Right. And they would start kind of checking themselves. Mm. And <laughs> this, mm-hmm. the way they did it would be with my name. <laughs> so they would look at each other and say, well, Wilcox. I love it. <laughs> like, you're not supposed to be making those assumptions. Making Wilcox those would not yeah. approve. <laughs> Wilcox. And, and like, so, so they've, they've done this for years. Yes. Because every once in a while they text me like, oh, it happened again. It happened again. And sometimes it becomes like a little competition yes. where one of them calls the other out and the yeah. other doesn't, is like, yeah, well, I'm right though. This yeah. person's got to be gay. <laughs> and then they'll <laughs> they look it the up. Research, they'll yeah. do the research. They'll check themselves. Yeah. And, and more times than not. More times than not. <laughs> up, you were making an assumption and you were in correct yeah, uh, and that also goes back to those untested assumptions <laughs> right, like and then absolutely. testing them absolutely um, so yeah if you find good. yourself making assumptions you just, have my permission just, to use yeah, my yeah. name just, just say, say Wilcox. Wilcox. <laughs> Wilcox yes I love it and that's that's the code from now on to check check your assumptions <laughs> I love it well and, and along with the idea of checking our assumptions uh what is our our well, we have a question. I was going to go to our skill, but our question. I know I was trying to like I know, visually like you. like, no, you're skipping something. I'm skipping. <laughs> I always like to skip over the question. I don't like to, but I always do. Um, but our question, like, so as we're thinking about all of these things and coding and signaling and all of those things, what about things like the hanky code? Isn't that, isn't that gaydar? Yeah, so so that's an aspect of this broader gaydar discussion that that's the kind of question I got a lot. And well, and for the audience who, who might not know this, there's a thing uh, from gay history and sometimes gay present called yeah. the the hanky code, where mm. back in the day, you know, uh, gay men uh, didn't couldn't be out safely, mm-hmm. um, but wa- often wanted to kind of communicate to other gay men right. that they were interested maybe in a sexual encounter, those mm-hmm. kinds of things. And so there's this thing called the hanky code where they have different colored handkerchiefs that you stick out of your back pocket. And, mm-hmm. and there's a whole code around it where, there, you know, a given color means you're interested in a certain thing and it means something different if you're on the right-hand side or the left-hand mm-hmm. side and and so on. And there are actually other codes like that mm-hmm. as well. There's one called the, the pin drop code. 
where if, if you're, say, sitting on a bench in a park and a man walks past you and drops a hairpin, mm. like a lady's mm-hmm. hairpin, mm-hmm. that was him indicating that he was gay and maybe interested in a hookup or, right, right, or right. whatever, because there wouldn't be a reason for a straight man to have a hairpin, right. uh, allegedly. Um, and, you know, if you do that and the, the person you drop the pin in front of is a straight man, mm-hmm. he won't know he why you did it. that because he, he doesn't that? know the code. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it was a safe way to, to do that kind of yeah. thing. Those are explicit communication. Mm-hmm. That's not mm-hmm. detecting in a gaydar kind of way that someone's mm-hmm. gay. It's mm-hmm. you're both explicitly communicating. Yes. Uh, and, th- and that's the difference there. Whereas this, this broader notion of gaydar, it's yeah, I have a sense I can tell what your sexual yes. orientation is mm-hmm. without explicit communication. Yeah. No, I think that's that makes a lot of sense. I have, I have two thoughts. One was that even in the in the 90s and I don't you can correct me and tell me oh. if this is accurate. But I, um and I've never I've never known, but I remember in the 90s it used to be a thing that people would say like the wearing one earring. Oh yeah. And now I don't know if that's true or not, but like if you wore one earring and it, depending on which side it was on, it would indicate whether or not you were gay. That was something that people always said. Yeah, it Again, was I have no idea to, supposedly, if it's true or not. Supposedly if, if you have an <laughs> earring on the right hand side that mm-hmm. indicates gay right a man with an earring on the left hand side right yeah that's not. what i that's what i remember but again i have no idea if that was accurate or not but again that explicit communication yeah. and you know i am thinking about this documentary that i saw and i it's um I saw it on Netflix. I don't know if it's an actually a Netflix documentary, like produced by Netflix, um, that it centered. um, It was uh, David Thorpe is his name. um, And the the documentary is called Do I Sound Gay? And he's exploring like his voice. And he was like, he gets all the time that he sounds gay or people, quote unquote, know he's gay by his voice. And so he goes through this whole journey of talking to a bunch of celebrities, um, including George to K and like a bunch of other people. <laughs> oh my. I know. Oh my. Um, and um, and then he also goes through like speech therapy with a few folks and um to kind of like retrain his voice. And and as he's going through his own exploration, he realizes that um he actually intentionally changed his voice when he was 17 when he came out because he was trying to explicitly communicate to folks Absolutely. that he was gay you know and so there is this again that there's a piece of it that for him it was a or at least started off as a means of explicitly communicating to people and i think that's true of, of so many gay people they right. they're they're just coming out they're just connecting with the yeah. gay community at yeah. large or at least people of our generation and older <laughs> yes. kids these days gen x they they have a whole new take on sexuality yeah, and gender expression true. which i think is great it's uh, beautiful which i yes. think makes these gay are uh, inaccuracy even or the idea that Gator could be accurate it's even more dubious with the younger generation mm, yes which I think is great right. people are expressing 100%. themselves the way they want mm-hmm. but yeah I think there's kind of a curve where kind of in our generation and older first coming out it's like you immediately like I'm gay now so what do I do what and, do I do and how do I make sure everybody have, knows yeah, yeah the first thing you have is the stereotypes mm-hmm. and so you uh, adorn them right right yeah whether that's through your, how you're you're dressing your voice or you know again i think i off camera when we were talking about this like wearing rainbows like yeah. well not only gay people can wear rainbows Absolutely. i'm wearing rainbow glasses right now and rainbow earrings right <laughs> like um right so those kind of how do i explicitly do these like it's not really a virtue signal, but like, how do I signal? Yeah. And maybe even stereotyped ways. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, the the one other uh, response to that, that kind of question, mm-hmm. what about things like, uh, yeah. there's also, uh, in terms of direct communication, there's mm-hmm. communication that I'm interested in you, yeah. which is different from you can sense what my sexual orientation mm-hmm. is. So some people are like, oh, well, there was a time I made eye contact with this guy. He made eye contact with me. Yeah. We knew. Yeah. We knew each other was gay. And then, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. we connected. And it's like, well, you're picking up that the person's attracted to you. Right. Not the same as picking up that he's gay. Right. Because so, the same thing. Let's imagine he wasn't attracted to you. Right. My my dear friend Gary calls this the, quote, ugly people don't have gaydar <laughs> arguments. <laughs> so let's just say you're a very unattractive right, person. Right. You may 
make eye contact with someone you're attracted to, mm-hmm. they're not interested. They're not going to hold they're that eye contact. Hold it. Right. So it's not that, you, and then you're like, oh, well, he's not gay. Right. No, it's no, not that he's not gay. Not he wasn't attracted, he wasn't to, attracted you. to you. So detecting yes. a specific attraction to you isn't the same as identifying someone's sexual, sexual orientation. orientation. Yeah, that's really good. And also, like the other indicators that I think that we often will then use is also um, even looking at like, who we assume somebody's partner is, right? Like, oh, yeah. even if they're there, just because you are in a uh, opposite sex relationship doesn't mean you're straight, or you know, Absolutely. or just because you're with a same sex partner or um, whatever, or phenotypically, expressively, you know, opposite or same sex doesn't mean that that's an indicator of your sexuality either. There are so many like sexualities in between that you can't just say, oh, that somebody's straight or gay based on who their partner is either. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. And so thank you for that. Well, actually, I'm going to ask one more question. Go for it. it. Um, so there is, and you know, we can, we can give this or cut this, but I have a question about straight passing, right? And the oh. idea of straight passing um, as both intentional, unintentional. And I think that that's also part of the like yeah. gaydar and, um, and stereotyping too. Totally. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that goes all the way, gosh, way back to, I think it was our second episode yeah. talking about professionalism. And yes. Everyone has to wear the same suit. Everyone right. has to look the same yes. way, suppress their, their identities that stick right. out. Yeah. And I think there are many professions where mm-hmm. that's the norm. And so people conform to that. Mm-hmm. So that's, that can be one yep. idea of this, this kind of passing, passing. like you're, yeah. you're not displaying overt gay stereotypes right. is what straight passing really means. Right, right, uh, right, right. And so you're able to move through spaces with it as a non-visible uh, and non-assumed right. identity that yes. you have. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah and yeah. I think uh, for, um, for many gay folks, mm-hmm. they, they do that to fit into the professional yeah. world. Yeah. And then I, I would ask you, what, yeah. what kind of negative mental health effects might that have if you're not right. being your authentic yes. self? Yes. Uh, whether or not, you know, that means a stereotypical mm-hmm. display, mm-hmm. But, but kind of suppressing that side of yourself if for that sure. is part of who you truly are, right. so to speak. Right. Well, I mean, I have a I have a particular bias to say that it there are negative uh, effects, and we see that not just in the explicit expression of you know your sexuality, but also like your race, your ethnicity, yeah. your culture. When we're trying to suppress that or trying to um, compartmentalize parts of ourselves, like it starts to come out in our body in different ways, right? And yeah. often we start to, you know, the term is somaticize. Um, yeah. And so when we're really suppressing parts of ourselves, whatever that might be, um, it comes out in our body. You know, it comes out headaches and stomach aches and, and anxiety, panic attacks. <laughs> like we start to have these like cumulative effects because our mind and our body are so connected. And so when there's a part of us that we are trying to hold back and so much, then it's taking so much effort. Um, our body responds to it and it, it like reacts to it. Right. Totally. So, um, and I, and I think, you know, I, <laughs> we haven't talked about drag queens yet today, this episode, <laughs> so I have to bring them up. Um, but you know, I also, when thinking about like straight passing, whether it's intentional or unintentional quote unquote, because you don't fit the stereotype, um, that there's also those like protective factors too around yeah. certain situations and certain spaces of like, okay, I don't know. I don't know what this space is. Is it, is it safe for me here too? Yeah. And like doing and acting in certain ways that maybe try to explicitly counteract somebody's maybe negative perceptions of you. Yeah. 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 All right. So thank you for answering all of my questions. <laughs> um, and I'll go back to what I was trying to, <laughs> what I was trying to skip over um, earlier, what I was uh, going to and skipping over the question was our skill for today. What is yeah. our bias habit breaking skill? So uh, in the kind of main topic section, um, I already mentioned kind of two of the ways that our brain like tries to perpetuate stereotypes. So untested assumptions yep. and confirmation bias. And they have a, a, a third partner um, in the kind of big three that I always emphasize. Another way that our brain uh, 
works to maintain the, these mental habits that it has. And that's called attentional spotlight. Mm. And so what this is, is your, your attentional processes, what, what your brain is kind of drawn to uh, or drawn away from is biased in favor of supporting stereotypes. So right. we tend to notice examples that support stereotypes more. Our attention gets drawn to them more and our attention gets drawn away from examples that disconfirm stereotypes. So in the Gator kind of thing we've been talking about today, this means, you know, your attention will more often get drawn to gay men who are displaying kind of right. more stereotypical traits and your attention gets drawn away from those who don't so that overall your brain is going to be like, oh, mo most of the time the stereotype is true. Right. Uh, one way this plays out in workplaces a lot, um, there's kind of a, a common idea and, and I always feel a little cliche bringing this example up because it appears in sitcoms all the time. So I feel like everyone already kind of understands it as a thing, but, it, but it's a form of gender bias. Mm. Uh, where there, there's gonna a workplace and there's a bunch of people sitting around the table and everyone's kind of working on whatever the problem of the day is. And a woman speaks up with some kind of great idea about how to solve the problem. And people kind of overlook her idea. Right. And a few minutes later, a man speaks up and says the exact, exact same thing. thing. Yes. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden people notice it. Right. That's one way this, this kind of attentional spotlight can mm -hmm. play out. You know, there's this tacit stereotypical expectation that the good big mm -hmm. ideas come from men and not so much women. Yes. Uh, and so attention gets drawn more strongly towards the man with the good idea than right. the woman with the good idea because right. it's not expected from that corner as right. much. Uh, so these attentional spotlights uh, lead us to keep noticing evidence that confirms stereotypes so that our brain can keep uh, relying on them using these habits it has in place. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and clinically, we see this, too, if, especially when we have a fundamental belief about ourselves. Um and we then pay more attention to the things that then, you know, it's, you know, wrong confirmation bias, but we're just paying more attention. Like, okay, if I have the belief that like oh, nothing goes right for me, right? And I go throughout my day and actually everything's gone really, really well. I might even be doing something that's outside of my comfort zone. It was successful. I had a successful day at work. I had all of these really positive things happen. And then, one thing didn't quite go perfectly. And all of a sudden I'm like, see, nothing ever goes right for me. <laughs> all my the life, attention drawn to it. All the attention gets drawn to this one incident that maybe wasn't, when, you, especially when you look at like the number of things actually did go right and maybe a big thing um, and drawing attention to just the one piece that didn't and that can keep us in a really negative space. It can keep us in depressed spaces. It can keep us in an anxious spaces, self-loathing spaces. Cases, yeah. right all of these things maintaining because, the status quo exactly rather than like being able to say like okay we're we taking the time to reframe and kind of rethink how do i how do i look at the bigger look, look at the larger picture how do i draw my attention to all of the other things that maybe did go right um so that we can kind of counteract this uh, again this attentional bias this attentional spotlight on the one thing that didn't go positively. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as always, I think these clinical insights and kind of tying them into what we're trying to help people with, mm -hmm. uh, working on overcoming biases. So, so crucial and helpful and exciting. Thanks. Yeah. Why we make great partners. Yay. <laughs> Awesome. Well, so that was our, our skill for today. Yes. Now, good. as always, we love ending with a recommendation for joy, something that is joy. bringing one of us joy or sometimes mm -hmm. both of us joy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we think it might bring you joy as well. Yeah. So uh, tell us, Amber, you have a recommendation <laughs> for today. What's bringing you joy? Yes. Well, um, I, I'm just reflecting on that you and I, we are... Uh, media girlies <laughs> <laughs> yes. that we really like uh tv and movies and those have been our primary recommendations and so i'm i'm following the theme and giving another tv show and it is called home economics um and i really like it from a diversity perspective because they have a lot of representation and so nice. it focuses on the set of three siblings that are at three different kind of social quote unquote social classes um, 
Um, the main character is um, the, in the middle. He's married to um, a Latino woman um, and he's a writer and he's writing. He writes a book called Home Economics on the three various like social classes, economics classes of his siblings, him and his oh. siblings. And so his oldest brother or his brother, I don't know if he's older or not. I can't remember where in the, the line, but um, the, the brother is like got is in like finance of some sort and is like a millionaire, billionaire, single dad. Um, and so he's got the highest echelon, right? Um, and then his sister, the main character who's Topher Grace, um, is his sister is a social worker and ah. she is married to um, Shashir Zamata. I'm pretty sure I'm saying her name correctly. Shashir Zamata, a black woman. Um, and they have two black adopted children um, and they live in this like little teeny tiny like studio apartment, the four of them. And so they are like always struggling they barely have enough money they live again they live in the studio apartment whereas the ones in the middle have a nice house they have a couple kids and then the brother has like a mansion it's just him and his daughter um and so anyway it, it deals with a lot of things around class and race and just a lot of things but it's just a fun show um and watching all the dynamics so it's called home economics i watch it on hulu i don't know if it comes on other streaming services but i I'd recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. That does sound like a lot of fun. I, I'm going to add it to my, my to list because I am always looking for exciting, New fun things. shows. Yeah. And I trust your recommendations. Thanks. Um, but yeah, I definitely reckon, uh, recommend Home Economics. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm Dr. William Cox. And I'm Dr. Amber Nelson. Produced by Eric Roman Binding with music by Jay Arner. Diverse Joy is consumable as either an audio-only podcast or a video podcast, both accessible at diversejoy.com. Diverse Joy is the official podcast of Inequity Agents of Change, a nonprofit devoted to the dissemination of evidence-based approaches to reduce bias, create inclusion, promote equity, and enhance diversity. All that good Jedi Jedi work. work. Learn more at biashabit.com. Thanks for listening. Bye. We don't know we've done a good job until we get our clicks. <laughs> Who want to reofficial?